3 a.m. on February 1966 in Accra, Ghana. My mother and four daughters, myself included, had all just traveled from London to Ghana. Soldiers with rifle butts start beating down the door. They shoot the doorman and they start firing at whoever comes into their path. They use those rifle butts to break every window and every door in the, in the entire house. Uh, they come to my mother and the children, all of whom are screaming, and they put a gun to my mother's head. And they say, choose. One of your children is going to die tonight, choose. And, and my mother is trying to calm the children because the children are screaming. And the soldiers are drunk because they're so young, many of them have never handled guns before. And as they went to pull the trigger because she wouldn't choose, the soldier stumbled and didn't hit my mother. And somehow she got herself and her daughters out of the house that night. That night, up and down the street, there were beatings and rapings and killings and floggings. It was the night of the first military coup after the independence of Ghana in 1966. I have absolutely no memory of what I just said. The reason that I know that story is 30 years after it happened, my mother broke her silence for the first time and told that story. The reason why it shapes how I move through the world is that the, the silence of that day and my absence of memory of the actual event didn't change the fact that I had to live with the legacy of the trauma of that night that was untreated for 30 years. It interrupted the progress of my career. It interrupted the health of my relationships with other people, women and men. It kept showing up in ways that I didn't understand. And no amount of education shifted that. So what I learned was that you cannot PhD your way out of trauma. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. And um, what, I learned that, what I learned was that we have co compartmentalized this thing that is emotionality and nurtured our educational selves, nurtured our intellectual selves, nurtured our spiritual selves, and expected that somehow emotionality would just catch up with where you are intellectually, educationally, uh, and that's how we move through the world. And yet it, w it doesn't do that. Its power means that it will at some point come to interrupt, to paralyze to stall, to install itself and to force you to pay attention. So for me, emotional justice became what I call an intimate revolution. That is, I want to change. How do I go from wants to willing? There's an ocean between those spaces. How do I negotiate with my resistance? It doesn't just start within, it comes from process. So we create policy that says, Violence against women is illegal. We create the policy that says that. And then we build platforms in which to on which to issue calls to action that are about people understanding why it's dangerous and making a call to change. Emotional justice is about the process that you create to make that real for yourself and have that change for other people.